publishing that to our website after the fact. Uh, so you'll have the chance to listen later or share that uh, internally with your organization um, uh, just as, as you sort of hear some of the information that we have here today. So uh, we, we've been really uh, focusing this uh, conversation and this webinar uh, on uh, Magento's end of life uh, for uh, Magento One. And we really wanted to dive into what happens after the end of life date. Uh, we sort of have seen uh, some, uh, uh, some, 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 some questions about that as an agency. We deal with a lot of uh, uh, project inquiries. I have a lot of merchants who have been on M1 or are on M1, uh, and they really want to understand sort of why that June 2020 date is significant. And I, I've got a, a really great panelist with me here today, uh, uh, and would love for her to introduce herself and, and talk a little bit about her expertise in e-commerce. Well, hi. So nice to meet everybody. My name is Mindy Regnell. I'm a competitive intelligence manager over at BigCommerce. Um, I've been in e-commerce now for uh, over a decade. Um, I actually have a history as a small business owner myself. Um, I jokingly like to say I'm seven years clean and sober on running an online store. Um, but I actually, um, just going to start by dating myself. I ran my online store um, on ProStars back in the day. Um, and I've, I've, I've gone through a few end of life myself, um, both as a, um, as a merchant, um, as an individual working with merchants migrating platforms as part of BigCommerce's uh, catalog transfer data migration team, um, where I was part of that team for three and a half years. Um, and I have working knowledge of over uh, you know, 30 different platforms. Having worked on that team, we were moving uh, data regularly from you know, 25 plus platforms. So um, just really started with a deep understanding of, of e-commerce from a data perspective and having done it myself. Um, so gone through a few end of lives, um, and it's definitely um, an interesting experience, um, especially when the date feels like it's just constantly changing as has happened with Magento One. And my name is Jordan Brannon. I'm the president at Coalition. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, e-commerce focused agencies supporting small and mid-sized businesses in the United States. Uh, we are a Magento partner and we also work with uh, a number of leading e-commerce platforms like BigCommerce. Uh, we sort of hand pick those. It's one of the things that so we've always uh, been very uh, proud uh, is that we've been a, a platform agnostic agency who is uh, not dependent or beholden on any one e-commerce platform uh, and that really gives us a lot of freedom in, in picking and making uh, the right recommendation for our merchants uh, in terms of helping them to select what platform they need to be on, uh, when to do some of these moves, and how to do them in a way that best supports their particular business. And so I uh, hope I can lend some of that uh, expertise for you all today. And certainly I'm available to you post-call as well. Uh, so we have four uh, topics that we're going to be uh, uh, looking to address, four questions that we're looking to, to be addressing today. Uh, the first question that we want to be able to provide a, a solid answer for is, do you really need to move? Uh, is, is there a viability for Magento One for you uh, as a merchant uh, post uh, June 2020? Uh, secondly, we're going to be looking to uh, really address that timetable. Uh, what does that June date really mean in terms of sort of imminence and, and how uh, important is it to have your e-commerce store uh, either off Magento One by June 2020? Uh, by that date or shortly thereafter. Uh, we'll also hopefully be able to uh, uh, really address a question of cost. Uh, there is a, a lot of concerns obviously with any sort of uh, bigger uh, software change or, or migration. Uh, and so there is a, a common question we get is, you know, how much does this cost? Can it, uh, some, is it something I can afford or my business can afford, our business can afford? And then finally, we also wanna hopefully help paint a picture about sort of some uh, green fields that, that do come with moving off of an aging e-commerce platform and into something uh, that is a bit newer. Now, uh, Mindy, one of the things that was surprising to me, uh, just in terms of sort of research for this webinar, uh, was that uh, we were finding about 400,000 live domains still apparently using Magento One architecture. What are some of the reasons that you've heard that uh, you know, people are giving for saying, well, this is why I'm still on Magento One, this is why I haven't moved yet? What are some of the, the feedback items that you've had there? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting. Um, I think for a lot of folks in the industry, we would assume people would obviously want those new features, those new shiny things that come with 
um, being on a platform that's, you know, currently getting updates and things of that nature. But that's not really that Magento One crowd. They've just invested a ton of time, a ton of money, and a ton of energy into their Magento One site to get it to work just the way that they want it. They're not really moved and motivated by, well, I can get this new shiny thing over here. They're just uh, generally of the mentality, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and so I think that's been one of the most surprising things about Magento One as it comes to an end of life. So, um, you know, with that in mind, Jordan, you know, what should these merchants be thinking about in terms of do they really need to move? Yeah, and, th and that's really sort of the, the big question that we are fielding, um, mostly from Magento merchants uh, on M1 today. They've, they've stuck it out past uh, a sequence of, of updates and announcements. Uh, and uh, are sort of in this position of saying, well, maybe I don't really need to move. Um, and, and I, I wanted to turn to Magento's director of support operations uh, here specifically to kind of answer that question. Uh, and, and sort of the ironic thing to this is this was provided in September 2018. And that specifically was we're encouraging all Magento customers uh, to start their upgrade planning as soon as possible. Uh, and so really, uh, this is something that, again, as of September 2018, uh, according to Magento, was an ASAP uh, uh, thing. You, you were supposed to be kind of be thinking about that way. And so there really is a, a need to be looking forward uh, to what you're going to be doing next in terms of your e-commerce platform, and there has been uh, for some time. Um, and really, I, I wanted to kind of highlight what end of life means to uh, Magento merchants. So they have a better picture as to what happens uh, and why it's important for them uh, to be looking at making that uh, move sooner than later. Uh, so as of uh, June 2020, uh, your store will continue to function. There's not going to be some sort of weird uh, static feedback noise and a, a sad sounding blip. And then all of a sudden your store shuts off online um, and the, the internet refuses to allow you back in um, as of June 2020. Uh, as a hosted platform, as long as you're paying for that hosting and you have that software installed uh, and it's being maintained, your Magento store can stay live uh, and, and operational in some way, shape, or form. Uh, really, though, there's sort of two big drawbacks to continuing with Magento One, um, and those drawbacks uh, really start to accelerate uh, in significance and potential impact as we move past that June 2020 date. Uh, first is insecurity, and, and most Magento merchants that we work with are already familiar with the security risks uh, that, uh, that come with the platform, and those just accelerate as you uh, move past this end of life, uh, because Magento is not actively going to be publishing or promoting uh, security patches, uh, and that creates a, a big void in terms of, of understanding when you need to be uh, improving a, a particular element of your site for, for a more secure outcome for you and for your customers. And then finally, Magento is also going to stop providing quality fixes to Magento One versions. Uh, this is something they've been a little slower on anyways, uh, but Magento One has long had a reputation as having a bit of a slower performance. Um, and ultimately, um, that just again starts to accelerate as the rest of the e-commerce market continues to move ahead, uh, you continue to fall further behind. Now, one of the big things with Magento uh, that we are stressing with a lot of our merchants and for some of the smaller to mid-sized stores who are maybe doing um, uh, do who are maybe looking at a uh, you know maybe sub 10 million dollars annually one of the things that a lot of them seem to be sort of uh, unaware of uh, is the fact that ultimately they are responsible for magento's security uh, they sort of have had this perception that uh, magento is doing a lot of active work on their stores behalf specifically to keep them secure. But Magento is fairly community driven on the open source side of things. They do publish security patches, but none of those security patches ultimately are implemented unless uh, you as a business owner or you as an IT team or you as an e-commerce team are really getting in and starting to maintain them. Um, and so uh, that's not an insignificant responsibility for you as a, a store to maintain. Uh, we, we had seen a sort of a recent statistic that says there's an estimated 30,000 plus websites that are hacked globally on a daily basis. Many of those are using open source uh, content management systems uh, widely. Uh, and what happens when you're part of a very popular open source solution is that you're sort of an easy target. If someone can automate uh, some sort of compromise or scripting, uh, they're going to be able to compromise your store and a lot of other stores uh, on a, uh, a very rapid basis. And that creates a, a lot of potential liability for you as a store owner. Now, 
one of the other pushbacks we've heard from this is the sort of mindset of, well, really there isn't that many security liabilities or, or vulnerabilities with Magento as a platform. And so I can continue to coast and then I'll cross the bridge of dealing with a security uh, breach when it happens. Uh, but Magento is regularly identifying new unpatched vulnerabilities in their, in their versions. There were 17, I did a, a hand count uh, from their uh, uh, patch bulletins. Uh, there were 17 in the last 12 months, so they're averaging over one per month. And so past June, you just don't have uh, uh, Magento as sort of a parent organization uh, providing some of that uh, backup. Uh, and so that sort of creates an accelerated risk um, uh, to, uh, it creates an accelerated risk to you as a, as a merchant where every month you go by, you're potentially looking at an additional uh, security vulnerability uh, patch that you would have had before, you maybe wouldn't uh, have today. Uh, I also touched on website performance. Uh, one of the big challenges that you have as an e-commerce store is people's expectations increase. They don't decrease. So people want faster websites. They want websites that load uh, agreeably on a current uh, hardware stack. So, so the new versions of iPhones or, or Android uh, flagship phones. Uh, they they want to see that go faster. Uh, they want a, a prompter bit of feedback from the websites that they're interacting with. And Magento One has never really been known as a uh, a really nimble platform in, in that regards. Uh, and so without Magento providing quality fixes or performance enhancements to the Magento One uh, stack, you, you essentially are in a position where you continue to fall further off the pace uh, of the front runners. Um, it's sort of an ironic element here, the screenshot was pulled from uh, Google PageSpeed Insights specific to Magento's own website. And so uh, I thought it was a little ironic that a platform that was known for maybe underperforming out of the box uh, without a lot of expensive upgrades and enhancements, uh, also had a slow uh, uh, marketing website themselves. Um, Google had uh, had released a statement, uh, one of their uh, webmaster series that said that two seconds really is the acceptable threshold for e-commerce stores in terms of a load time. Uh, and Google uh, as an organization aims for under half of a second. Uh, most marketing landing pages don't measure up to that speed, especially on Magento. Uh, if you look at sort of slower use case scenarios, so an unreliable cell connection at like a 3G speed, Google wants to really cut off at five seconds or less. And, and most Magento stores are, are really benchmarking at a much uh, slower pace than that. Uh, and so you have this sort of personal and professional responsibility as an M1 store owner to try to absorb all of those things yourself moving ahead. Uh, and again, it's really a, 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 almost an impossible feat. And so you start to get into a position uh, where you start to fall further and further off the pack. Um, and, and Mindy, that sort of brings me to my question for you though, is there's a lot of good reasons that people need to be looking at moving their e-commerce stores uh, off of Magento One. But one of the big questions that we still see is, do I need to move now? Uh, and, and is there anything in, in sort of uh, kind of current uh, news or any news cycles like that that you're seeing that sort of helps uh, kind of clarify like why it's important to get this done today versus in 12 months time and you kind of push it off again further. Uh, so that's sort of the question I'd love to hear sort of your feedback on. Yeah, so I think that the very short answer that I think is probably not going to be surprising to anyone is the answer is yes, you should definitely be moving um, and you shouldn't be putting this off. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that as uh, an end of life happens, you feel like you've gotten prepped. Um, I said I ran an online store. Um, I was working for a large reseller of pro stores um, called Homestead, and they moved all of their um, merchants from pro stores uh, actually over to Big Commerce, which is how I kind of ended up in the ecosystem. Um, gosh, we did about a year beforehand. Um, I started, I was the first store to get on there. They figured, gosh, if you can take this crazy employee who's just done everything the weirdest possible way and you can move it, you can move anybody. Um, and then life just happened. Much like today, um, life is just super unexpected. Um, and I ended up waiting until the very last minute to move. Um, and, you know, we experienced a little bit of downtime for my store, which was a little embarrassing as somebody who works in the industry. Um, but I had to own it. It, it was um, just the, the nature of the beast. So, I think it's really important to think about how do you move and how do you in a time frame like now where June is just rapidly approaching. I'm still trying to figure out where March went, 
um, to, to get your ducks in a row and start moving as agilely and quickly as possible. So, so what are some of the um, big, big reasons there for, for looking at that, that move? Yeah, so I think security is, is obviously the most important part of why people are wanting to make a move and why people should definitely move off of Magento 1 as soon as possible. Um, you know, if you think about it, um, everybody has an experience at some point, hopefully as, as few and infrequently as possible, where they've either had their credit card stolen or they know they have shopped on at a store or on a website that was hosted by a particular platform that's had a hack. So 71% of Americans are really worried about having that credit card information stolen. Um, and 66% of businesses that are attacked by hackers say they wouldn't be able to recover. Um, and the reason they wouldn't really be able to recover is the fines and the fees and the work that goes into solving for that. So Adian, who's um, one of the major payment gateways um, over in Europe, um, was probably one of the first to come out and say, hey, if you're still on Magento 1 um, past end of life, without those additional security patches, you're not going to be PCI DSS compliant. And that's going to be a really big deal. Um, they're one of the first that have come out there and said, hey, this is what those fines can cost. That's 10,000 to 25,000 euros per month. That is not a small amount. Nope. Um, I know when I was running my own online store back on pro stores, but this is, gosh, way back in the day, people would store the credit card information in pro stores. They would then, you know, knuckle buster it and punch it in on their, you know, point of sale system because it was cheaper. Like the, the amount of risky things that people do on an online store is, is pretty high um, when you're not thinking about security. And even when you're very security minded, um, the first time you find out what those fees are, it's like heart failure. Yeah. So I really feel for those small businesses that either know what they're putting on the line by being a little bit risky or maybe you're just a little um, unaware. Hmm. And Adian is the first company to come out and talk about this. Yeah, the one that I've been hearing a lot about, it was the uh, Visa, Visa uh, advisory uh, that just came out. And can you kind of walk us through what was said by, by Visa there? Yeah, so Visa actually came out within the last week talking about how their um, advisory is urging merchants to move off of Magento 1 before end of life. Now, the date for end of life has shifted a little bit in the fact that Magento has very clearly described it as June 2020. Um, so when Adian first published that Help Center article, they were talking about June 1st, and now that date has shifted to the end of June. So when you think about needing to be off Magento 1, ideally you want to be off of it before July 1st. So um, I know that part's a little bit confusing as you think about the timeline for moving, but uh, Visa has come out and said you will not be PCI DSS compliant because of those lack of security patches and the increased vulnerability that you'll have after June of 2020. So it's super imperative that you move soon and that you get started as soon as possible. So I know it's, um, oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, so that that, put, that loss of uh, PCI DSS compliance is a big one. Uh, we touched on sort of the compliance fines. What were some of the other uh, areas where uh, we saw some, some added risks with staying with M1? Yeah, so, you know, the risks really come down to a lot that has to do with that PCI compliance. So first and foremost, your biggest risk is that loss of PCI DSS compliance. Um, that means your payment gateway could decide that they're not going to work with you anymore. Um, if you're still on Magento 1 and you think there's a risk that you may not be able to migrate in time, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some ways that you can be really agile, make sure you've had a conversation with your payment gateway. Um, and make sure that they know whether or not they're going to continue supporting you. Um, so you're also going to have potential compliance fines like Adian mentioned. And then cleaning up a hack or a breach is a huge amount of work. It's not just going in and installing that patch. Visa gives you a long list of guidelines of, okay, here's what happens if you have a hack. Um, if you're in you know, the EU and you uh, have a hack, you could be at risk of violating GDPR compliance the list of things that you would have to do to properly handle a hack. And within a short amount of time frame, Visa wants you to respond and start taking action within three days. So you may not even know that you've been hacked. You may not have a patch in place yet, but you've already got to get the ball rolling. So again, you're not going to have 
uh, that PCI compliance, you're at increased risk of exposure to those security risks because Magento is not looking out for it for you. And you're in an increased likelihood of account data being compromised because of those lack of path changes. And the biggest, and I think one of the most unspoken things about a hack is the potential brand damage. So if you think about your store being hacked, you're gonna have to explain to your customers what happened. And that's a huge amount of trust that you're putting on the line um, I think we can all think of a time where we've been on a site, um, shopped with a major brand that we trust, and they've had a hack. Um, and you don't know whether or not your credit card information was stolen. Um, Target had a pretty big deal a while ago with Target uh, you know, cards being compromised. You then start worrying as a customer, well, gosh, did I make the right decision? Do I really need to shop there again? So um, the other thing that I think we can all think of is um, there have been some notable brands that when the news breaks, um, your reputation kind of goes a little bit through the ringer. Um, and probably the example that, that comes to mind to me most, because um, I am a big Jim Hansen fan, is Sesame Street Live. Um, they were on Volusion. Volusion had a hack and they had their credit card information exposed. And the number of punchlines that involved oh no, Elmo, your credit card information is out there. Um, while hilarious to the rest of us that it's, it's, you know, you're having a good joke, I'm pretty sure the folks over at Sesame Street felt a lot like Ernie did right there in that photo. Um, so I can empathize in terms of just, oh gosh, I really, you know, should have been more proactive. And I think that's one of the things that folks on Magento One um, struggle with the most is everything is very reactive as opposed to very proactive. Mm -hmm. I remember myself as just an e-commerce professional. I've, uh, I actually typically I have a little extension I use at Chrome that helps me know what particular websites are using. I, I tend to avoid M1 stores, especially if they look like they're on an older version of Magento. Um, uh, I've, I've been in a position where I was forced to buy something from a Magento One website after buying sort of a core product on Amazon. It was pushed back into this Magento funnel. I didn't really want to do it, but I did it anyways. And then sure enough, two weeks later, uh, I got a notice uh, that uh, my credit card was compromised and it was gonna have a new one sent and you have to kind of do the whole billing changeover. Uh, and so it's just that sort of frustration of, of being a, a consumer on that side of things and, and being somebody who knows better uh, than shopping uh, on some a Magento one builds is really sort of a, a, a frustrating thing that I can personally attest to. Um, I mean, we've all done it. I've done it too. So I think the next thing our, our merchants that are on Magento One would need to think about, and, and I'm sure you can give some great advice there, Jordan, is can I afford to do this? Yep. I spent a lot of time and a lot of money getting my Magento One store exactly the way I wanted it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I think so one of the biggest fears we have from uh, anybody we talk to is sort of looking at a replatforming project is that their bank vaults are going to be emptied. Uh, and any sort of savings they have and, and uh, any profitability they had is going to be wiped out by sort of tackling a, a bigger replatforming project and, and maybe look something a little bit like uh, the, the, the image back there. Um, and, and so project cost, uh, when we pulled uh, our, our merchants, uh, was the number one uh, concern. Uh, uh, and then following that was lost rankings, so concerns about how uh, a replatform project would hit uh, their SEO. Uh, and then behind that, there was a concern that they would lose data or content, that some information just in the process of getting from, you know, platform A to platform B, from Magento 1 to something else, uh, was really going to cause them to lose some valuable information that they would love to maintain. Uh, and then there was other concerns as well, sort of, you know, uh, maybe a degraded customer experience, maybe they didn't quite feel comfortable with what they're doing in terms of design. Uh, maybe they were worried about sort of the learning curve for their team to kind of pick up and, and uh, work with a new software after having worked with Magento One for three to five years. They felt like those sort of costs would be pretty high for them. And so we put together a couple of just quick stats uh, about some of those things to help provide some perspective there. Uh, from a, a North American agency reporting, so this is uh, based on sort of a North American agencies. Uh, that focus on e-commerce. The average e-commerce website costs twenty-three thousand dollars, and so uh, the kind of key emphasis there is average. So there is certainly an opportunity to be less expensive than that, uh, and there's an opportunity to invest more as well. And so uh, that's sort of the kind of typical uh, price point for for an e-commerce website. Uh, but sort of counterbalancing that, especially if you're a Magento One merchant, uh, is some of the actual cost savings that you'll get uh, by shifting. Um, off-platform. So for our SaaS merchants, and with specifically with big commerce, 
uh, we were seeing uh, savings of upwards of $1,000 uh, maintenance for their just maintenance costs. Actually, our big commerce merchants uh, weren't paying anything in the past 12 months from a maintenance standpoint. And by maintenance, I mean uh, fixing something that's broken or trying to prevent something from breaking. Uh, one of the great things with sort of the rise of, of SaaS as uh, software as a service is how we do e-commerce is it's really sort of shifted those costs away from the merchant um, and, and back to the software vendor and provider who really knows the platform better. And so uh, when you think about $1,000 a month in savings, um, uh, you know, for some of our bigger Magento merchants and for a typical Magento merchant, uh, typically around uh, twelve to $1,500 per year, you start to basically add those dollars back into the piggy bank, offsetting some of the investment of a new store, and it really starts to make some financial sense. Uh, we also, just as an agency, when we're looking at hiring, uh, bringing in a front-end developer for uh, any of the big SaaS platforms typically uh, has a 40% lower cost than if we were to bring in a Magento certified developer. And frankly, that has more to do with Magento's expensive testing and certification cycle uh, than it does to really have anything to do with sort of the quality of the developer we're working with. Um, we've also seen uh, benefits to our merchants where uh, their conversion rates are actually improving. Uh, so they get off of an older Magento store that they really haven't been maintaining well. They're not really getting sort of current uh, uh, feature rich technologies uh, from the software vendor. They're sort of dependent on a, a kludgy mix of, of customizations and extensions. Uh, to try to get their store running competitively and ultimately all of those things just don't work as well as they'd hope but so shifting off of magenta one has, has led to uh, a, an average improvement of 32 percent in terms of conversion rate and some stores it's even higher than that we've seen some stores where conversion rate has doubled just as the experience in checkout and throughout the store has improved um, again we've sort of hit on this one repeatedly today but it is a big point uh, zero costs in in security patch implementations uh, for our uh, SaaS platform customers, which is really, really fantastic. I mean, so you've been able to bring that, that pricing down uh, where you should be investing pretty regularly. That sort of asterisk that I have there is that a lot of our Magento One merchants are also under-reporting um, and underdoing it in terms of maintaining their Magento store already. Um, and so uh, that cost for them should usually be a lot higher. Uh, and they're just, the fact that they're sort of leaving things out there and vulnerable is, it seems to be more the norm because it is very expensive to maintain a Magento store in a secure way. Um, and then sort of as a final uh, concern to kind of address that potential SEO uh, fall off uh, in lost rankings was uh, we're seeing about 26 days till uh, traffic is fully normalized after migration. Now, one thing I would highlight there is that that is something you really can uh, control and you can minimize even further. Uh, so that, uh, that uh, time period doesn't have to be that long. Typically that 26 days is tied to uh, a, not only a full migration, but new content, new catalog, new design. So a bigger, more holistic change that Google has to adapt to. Um, and that sort of brings up some of the areas where uh, you can reduce the costs, you can reduce the risks, even down from some of the numbers that we've talked about here. Uh, one of the first tips that we're giving to a lot of Magento merchants given this sort of tight two month window uh, is migrate as is. Carry your catalog, your content, uh, your site navigation structure, and, and a lot of those features intact to your new e-commerce platform. Um, that does help. Uh, it, it reduces a lot of the upfront time and cost investment in terms of a redesign or reimagining your brand or redoing your product catalog and your product content. And so you save a lot of, of just upfront investment there but it also helps to move things faster because you don't have that back and forth with uh, either a freelancer or in-house team or uh, an agency like us. You can kind of skip right ahead three steps. Uh, you also are helping Google out because Google has a better understanding of all of those things already. Uh, and so one of the opportunities that you have there is that when you migrate as is and you have a platform like Big Commerce uh, where you can customize your URL structure, you can almost make it seem like it's the same website uh, to a search engine, and that really helps cut back on that, uh, that month or almost a month time frame that we might see. Uh, go with your minimum viable product. Really focus on the things that, uh, that you need to be operating and be operating successfully. Um, avoid wish lists. One of the things that we see often slow down a new e-commerce build is 
uh, the company has circulated the, the uh, requests uh, for the new platform to every member of their organization. And so you get everybody from uh, the front desk person who doesn't actually do anything with e-commerce uh, ultimately is submitting a request in for the new e-commerce site because of her favorite shopping experience. And those sorts of things, while some of them may be good, a lot of them end up going by the wayside anyways because they just don't provide value to the organization or to your customers. Uh, and so avoid those sort of wish lists and really focus back in on those needs of what you need to have on that new e-commerce platform out of the gates. And that usually makes it a lot easier to launch really quickly and really affordably. Uh, and we're also doing some things just as an agency ourselves uh, to help defer payments with some of our finance partners. So given that two month timeline, given sort of the, the economic climate with COVID-19, there is concerns around that front. Uh, and so a lot of agencies and companies are doing uh, what they can to help make this a more affordable process. Uh, our average mi Magento migration project has dropped uh, in cost by about 30% in the last uh, two and a half months. And that's because there's discounts on our hourly rates, there's discounting on plugins and extensions that you would normally be paying for. Uh, and, and great platforms like Big Commerce are also offering uh, free months uh, of service and support there as part of their, their offering here. And so taking advantage of those really does help uh, bring down the total cost of this new e-commerce website if you choose to tackle that um, on the um, front end of things. Um, and so I think kind of the, the last sort of thing I, I wanted to end and kind of our last point really to talk about was sort of what are the upsides? What are some of the things to look forward to, uh, Mindy, as we sort of look at uh, moving off Magento One? What are some of the things people should be looking forward to as, as sort of having a new e-commerce platform that is more current, it is more secure? What are some of those things? Yeah, so I think as, as merchants and start thinking about what does life look like after Magento One and, and more specifically, what it looks like for them after they've gotten off Magento One, it doesn't really matter where you go. Um, there are a lot of upsides, period, um, whether that be going to Magento Two or looking at other platforms like BigCommerce. Um, first and foremost, that security ticking time bomb of no more patches is going to go away because you're no longer going to be on a platform that is hitting an end of life and will stop being supported. So um, I also think, you know, when you think about security, it's probably time to evaluate how you handle security. Um, so if you're on Magento One now and you're used to a very reactive approach, it's definitely a great time to consider um, a SaaS platform and having a little bit more of a proactive approach because it's being handled largely for you behind the scenes. Those updates are kind of happening. The other good thing that merchants can kind of look forward to is new features. Um, you know, because you've spent so much time on Magento One and you've really focused on, I've got it the way it is, I just don't want to add another extension, I don't want to deal with anything else breaking, you've been passing up a ton of new features and new functionality that's out there. So it's definitely a great time to start taking advantage of those. Um, and don't worry about having to do all of those right away. Um, think about it in a very agile response. Um, so phase one, get everything over, go as minimal as possible, make sure it looks very consistent to Google. Um, you know, and a lot of uh, SaaS platforms, much like BigCommerce, have a much more open environment than they did in the past. So you can still build a progressive web app and have a very fast, responsive mobile site um, without, um, you know, having to worry about doing that right now. So the other thing that you'll have is those performance benefits. So the platform's regularly being updated in addition to security, things are getting faster, you're getting those updates that you need. And then the other thing I think a lot of um, merchants have to look forward to is kind of the support of an ecosystem, whether that be the Magento ecosystem as it shifts from Magento 1 to Magento 2. Um, that's where everybody's going to be, so don't get left behind. Um, and then also consider some different ecosystems and the support that's available. You know, a lot has changed um, in the last five years. Um, you know, I remember when Magento One had its announcement of end of life and then it shifted and then there was a lot of debate of when is this actually happening? And even to see that date feel like it shifted a little bit within June, um, you know, when you start thinking about the future of your business, who can you call on to get help? Is that an agency? Or, you know, does your platform have 24 seven tech support? Um, Magento 2 on its enterprise edition does have um, 24 seven ticket response. Um, and a lot of SaaS platforms, um, you know, like BigCommerce, uh, Shopify, 
Um, a lot of the other big players in the space have 24 seven tech support. So you can pick up the phone and speak to somebody at any time to get help when you need it, which I think is a huge upside. We had a couple of questions that did come in just during the course of, of the meeting. Uh, so one of the questions, maybe I'll field this one uh, first, uh, was uh, what happens if we're not really using e-commerce and sort of a traditional public e-commerce uh, e sort of offering? Um, you know, is there still risks to us if we're mainly using some of it as an informational platform that leads maybe into some sort of subscription or something like that? And so um, if you are not really depending on your typical public e-commerce experience, Magenta One still poses a lot of risks. A lot of these these hacks uh, are happening uh, not sort of in a obvious uh, sort of front end sort of experience. So they may be injecting malware into certain aspects of your site operation. Uh, they may be looking to scrape other information from people visiting your website and stealing email addresses or other sorts of content along those lines. Um, and so uh, potentially there's a, a opportunities for malicious redirects to occur where your website is used to point content or point users to uh, a harmful destination for them where a more significant compromise could occur. Uh, so, so even if you aren't necessarily thinking of your Magenta One store as like a typical fashion boutique, I'm going to go buy a, a dress and I'm going to check out without as a guest, that sort of thing is, is certainly uh, still a risk. There's still a reason to be off of Magento in that particular area. Um, I think uh, there was a question here uh, that we had just come in, Mindy. Uh, how difficult is it to move uh, the site uh, you have now uh, to an upgraded platform? Um, how, how much of a redesign is really needed? Um, you know, is there sort of big barriers to carrying your look and feel and content from Magento One to maybe a, a big commerce as an example? Yeah, so I'll speak to the, to the data aspect and I'll, I'll let you be the expert on design on the agency side. Um, you know, it's, it's really not that bad to, to move your data I think the biggest thing to think about when you're moving from one platform to another is what does the process of moving data look like? Um, and this is a little bit of a technical answer, so, so bear with me here. Um, working on a, on a data migration team, uh, they use a process called ETL, extract, transform, load. So moving data from one platform to another really comes down to can you extract that data from your current platform? There are just some things that certain platforms don't really let you export. Um, Magento is pretty good about that. The one thing I would say to just be super extra cautious about in terms of like, first of all, backup everything is make sure that you have a backup of those image files and your order data. Um, when you're talking about images, if something breaks on your Magento store, and this is probably the biggest pain point I encountered in working with merchants that were migrating, is if that image, if your database is just referencing an image URL, not the actual file and your images break on your live site, that URL is kind of useless. So it can be one of the most time consuming things to have to go back in and re-upload those images. Um, there are definitely some faster batch ways to do it, but it still takes a little bit of a, of a heavier lift. Um, the other step is transform. So you have to map up the equivalent um, over to you know, the equivalent on your new platform. So Magento 1 to Magento 2, there's still some transformation that has to happen because it's a different architecture. Mm -hmm. um, same if you're moving to big commerce to any other platform out there, you're kind of transforming it and then you have to be able to load it. So how open are those APIs and how fast are those APIs are really going to determine how long does it take to make those changes in batch. So Jordan, how about the site design aspect? Uh, how, did, how does that help? Yeah, I mean, one of the beautiful things with uh, big commerce and some of the other leading e-commerce platforms today is they're, they're extremely flexible on the front end in terms of that visual experience. And if you are coming off of a Magento One store, uh, you're typically going to find that what you have in terms of that front end UX, that front end design is very easy to replicate uh, on a different platform. Further, you're also going to typically um, have, it, it really where you save money and time is that you don't necessarily have to go back through a big design process. Start and say like, this is what I'm happy with today. This is what we've been successful with in terms of visual right now. And that allows you to skip ahead in terms of a discovery process and a design process. And then you can start operating on some of that migration of content um, in tandem with the actual build of you know, your existing design and interface uh, into a new e-commerce platform like a Magento 2 or a big commerce. Uh, and so that can be really a seamless, fast and, and affordable way of approaching it. Um, 
I guess we kind of maybe as a, a detail, we had a question that came in that was, what are some of the best practices for migrating uh, Mindy? And since you did ca a catalog transfer as a, a profession for a number of years, what are some of those, those particular opportunities? Yeah, so I think um, when it comes down to, to migrating your data, it's, it's really about making sure, first of all, that you have a really good backup um, and that you're really thinking through how to do things as, as seamlessly as possible. You know, a, a new platform can, can be a great opportunity to do things a little bit differently, but when you're on a super tight time frame, uh, it's better to just kind of stick with what you've got and make it go a little bit faster. Um, you know, BigCommerce, for example, has a great way to use consolidated options. So you can have one option set um, for, you know, size, color, that you can reapply over and over again to different products. Sometimes when you migrate, uh, because you're mass importing, it looks a little bit uh, uglier on the back end. It's not to say that your customers are ever really going to notice or see that difference, um, but you can go back in and kind of clean that up over time. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples, and this is this is my own personal um, store. I used to sell jewelry made out of Dungeons and Dragons dice and geeky theme buttons, which meant I had a drop down menu of 125 colors on pro stores. Um, and that was a nightmare. Um, but when I moved it over to big commerce, I left it as a drop down menu. Um, and part of why it took me so long was I was going back in and uploading color swatches and making that experience better. Um, and I ended up flipping the switch with it about half done because I just didn't have the time to finish. So it's okay to, to focus on being functional and being transacting rather than having everything 100% pixel perfect and doing that full redesign. And um, Jordan, I'm sure you can, you can kind of speak to some of those best practices from an SEO perspective as well. Yeah, and that was one of the questions that come in is what are the you know preventative uh, things that you can do to help ensure that your SEO authority, your rankings are maintained as you move. And I touched on them earlier. A, a lot of brands, they, they make replatforming harder than it needs to be and more risky than it needs to be because it becomes replatform plus rebrand plus revamp content plus revamp product catalog. And so it becomes a, a complete teardown. And so the example I often give, uh, if you run a retail boutique or retail store, it's usually not a great idea when you decide you want to open a new location or change the location of your boutique to also burn down your warehouse, right? Uh, it just is, is not something you would normally think to do, but that's how a lot of businesses approach uh, replatforming. And so if you carry over your catalog, if you carry over your content and your navigation, and especially again with big commerce, one of the unique advantages they have uh, with some of the top tier SaaS platforms is you can customize your URLs. And so you're really able to give Google or your search engine in, in, in question uh, an experience that is very, very similar to what you already had on your site that really reduces any sort of uh, foreignness or, or newness that Google might experience. It, it kind of the, the analogy I, I, I talked with Mindy about was uh, if you come back from the work from home uh, uh, COVID quarantine and you go back into the office the first day and you've shaved your head and you've gotten a full face and head tattoo uh, to look like a reptile person, chances are people are going to be pretty unnerved and, and pretty uncertain about uh, what happened uh, during uh, your, your time in quarantine. But if you come back and you have like a small a bicep tattoo or something along those lines, which is a bit more subtle and the change is there, but it's, it's not huge, it doesn't really impact people's perceptions of you. And so when you do a replatform, control the number of changes that Google is going to go through and your customers are going to go through. You'll typically find that that experience is a lot more affordable, but it also has a lot less uh, downside to it. So, and I think the last question we had come in was just how quickly, you know, what's feasible. We're uh, now mid-April, uh, people attending this call haven't started the process yet. How quickly can you get moved over, uh, Mindy, to, to like a big commerce or another platform if you're on M1 right now? Yeah, so I think the, the, the time and speed of which you can move um, really just depends on your, your flexibility of, of how agile um, you can go with this process. So I know there's a, a customer that's a joint client of ours called uh, True Linksware that had a, had a little bit of a, a, by little bit, I mean their Magento One site pretty much went down and they made the switch over um, in about 24 hours. Now that's not a full perfect polish move by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it's definitely a lot more preferable than leaving their site down for an extended period of time. So when you think about making that switch, first of all, I always recommend, again, back up everything. You never know when you're going to need something later. Um, I know I referenced a CSV file of my old orders when I moved off of Pro Stores. 
Um, and the number of times that I opened that CSV file twice, um, once to check when I had shipped something and the other time to go file my taxes later. Um, so it's better to have it than not have it, especially when it comes to any customization um, or your images in particular, just because I know that can be a real tricky point when moving. Mm -hmm. um, but focus on getting your top selling products, the things that people expect to have the most in an extreme scenario. Um, otherwise, as much as you can keep it the same, the better. And you can get up and running and make those bigger changes later. I'll, I'll to Jordan's point, I don't know if that shows, but I've got a tiny little tattoo on my arm mm -hmm. that you, oh, there it is. <laughs> so, so make those small changes after the fact. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's a great, great kind of suggestion. And one of the things with Magento too, is you, you don't have to just shut off your hosting. You can set it up on a subdomain like old.yourdomain.com for a, a week. And so as you sort of move past and you, you're live with your new platform, uh, you can always have access to even a navigable experience with your old Magento store. And then when you're confident, you've got all the data over everything's where you want it to be, shut down that hosting, save the money, uh, back up the data, as, as Mindy said, and uh, you're, you're in a great spot to move ahead. So I thank you all. We did run a little bit long with the questions there. I appreciate uh, you submitting those. Uh, we will send out a, a post webinar recap uh, for all of you who attended. Uh, including a link to rewatch the webinar. And we have some specific promotional offers. I mentioned that there's really a fantastic opportunity right now to save some money uh, in making this migration happen. Uh, and uh, so we've got a couple of incentives uh, along that, uh, that line uh, to share with you. And so we'll get that all out. Uh, thank you all for attending. If someone uh, you know would be interested in, in this project and you'd like to set up a phone call, uh, we can certainly make that happen as well and kind of review this as it pertains to your particular brand. Uh, we do that consulting free of charge here at Co Coalition so we can help kind of narrow down what the right platform is for you, uh, what the right migration plan should be, uh, and we can uh, help you uh, make that move happen in the next uh, 45 days or so. Um, and I uh, really look forward to speaking with you all, and we'll be in touch in a follow-up. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.